Hello, good afternoon or good morning, depending on your location, um, both to those of you who are in the Rand Washington office and those of you online. My name is Dr. Kirsten Keller. I'm a senior behavioral scientist here at Rand and I'll be the moderator for the event today. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us for this conversation, which is focused on how DOD can address its technical talent shortage. This panel is sponsored by RAND's Personnel Readiness and Health Program within RAND's National Security Research Division. Before we start, I just want to make a couple housekeeping notes. So first, our plan for today is we're going to have a discussion for roughly 40 minutes. Then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience. So please hold your questions until then, unless you have something you want to clarify. Um, for those of you in the Washington uh, RAND office in person, we do have microphones there if you would like to ask questions. And for those of you who are online, we'll be using Slido. There is a link to Slido that's in the invite, but we'll also put it here in chat. Um, if you do have a question, please state your name and your affiliation when you ask the question. And then finally, we do want to note that we're going to be recording today's discussion, and we'll make that available for public viewing in the coming days. So next, I want to introduce our panelists. So first, we have Dr. Diana Gelhaus. So she is an economist and policy researcher working at the intersection of tech and talent. Diana is currently a senior advisor for the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office, where she's building a data analytics and AI education and workforce strategy for the US Department of Defense. She was also previously a research fellow at the Center for Security and Emerging Technology, where she was leading research on domestic talent pipelines in AI and other emerging technologies. And then she was also an adjunct policy researcher at the Rand Corporation. Next, I want to introduce Mr. James Reiseff. So he is currently a senior technology policy analyst in Rand's Washington, D.C. office. Prior to joining RAND, James was a software engineer for 14 years in the private sector with a career spanning a variety of companies, including Microsoft and Google. He's the lead author of a report called Exploring the Civil Military Divide Over Artificial Intelligence, and is also an author on a report called The Race of US Technical Talent, Can the DOD and DIB Compete? His research focuses on artificial intelligence, data, and data governance, and applying best practices from the private sector, software engineering to modernizing government processes. And then next we have Dr. Maria Lytel. She is a senior behavioral scientist at RAND and former associate director of the personnel training and health program in the RAND Arroyo Center. Although she's worked on a variety of military workforce topics at RAND. In recent years, she's co-led projects on technical talent topics for DOD and the Department of the Air Force. Her work includes two companion projects for DOD on compensation and diversity of its uh, STEM workforce uh, and the STEM civilian workforce. And she's co-authored reports associated with these projects, including a report looking at demographic diversity of the STEM workforce in DOD as it relates to compensation and employment outcomes. So uh, panelists, thank you for being with us today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So to start off as a first broad question, so when we say the term technical talent, what does that mean? What does technical talent mean and why is it important? So Diana, I want to start with you on this one. What types of technical talent are important for DOD and why? Yeah, thanks. And thank you for having me here today to talk about one of my very favorite topics. Uh, I could talk at length about this. Technical talent is a moving term. And, and so I, I'm really glad to level set this conversation at the start because it means different things to different people. I think depending on who you ask is how, how you will define it, but that's really important because when we talk about things like recruitment and retaining, when we talk about things uh, you know, like the labor supply, uh, policies related to this workforce, it really does matter who you're talking about. I have seen definitions that, uh, you know, a lot of people gravitate towards STEM, but that is not uh, unique or uh, I think definitive. There's also, when you're talking about 
uh, organizations like the National Science Foundation. You talk about the science and engineering workforce. And that is actually a, a broad swath of talent that includes non-college graduates in technical and vocational uh, fields. And so I think there's a, a it, you know, there's important distinctions uh, really uh, specific to who you're talking to, uh, what about, and what you're trying to achieve. At the DOD, we've been really focused on cyber, software engineering, data analytics, and AI. And at CDAO, the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office, we're really, really focused on the data analytics and AI piece in partnership with our, our friends at r and and CIO who run the cyber and uh, software engineering workforce component. But why is it important? Uh, because this is the future. At DOD, we're really focused on digital transformation, uh, and you need the right people in the right place at the right time to make that happen. And you need people who are not only technically proficient in these areas, if we want to fight and win tomorrow's fight, but you also need a workforce who has some digital fluency. And so again, when we talk about the technical knowledge, skills, and abilities we need, we have to be thinking uh, about what, what is actually needed to uh, to be a competitive player when we're talking about a data and an AI enabled world, when we're talking about cyber threats as they are, when we're talking about multi-domain operations, uh, you know, that's where I think a lot of our work is focused on when we talk about technical. Okay, thanks. And James, I wanna now go to you based on the research that you've done, um, do you have anything to add in terms of what Diana said? But I'm also curious to get your perspective on whether this is the same type of technical talent that other industries are also interested in. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think unfortunately for DOD, it is very much the same kind of technical talent that other industries are interested in. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, like Diana was saying, you know, technical talent encompasses more than just STEM. Um, two um, disciplines in particular from the private sector, um, so product management and uh, data science are ones that actually often draw from outside the STEM discipline, right? Um, and so these often require a lot of uh, sort of softer skills to really shape the product in the right direction in the first place and sort of understand if you're even building the right thing, right? Um, and so it's relatively easy to identify a software engineer, you know, someone who graduated with a computer science degree, someone who can pass a test in some coding language, right? Those are people that, that as long as you have the right recruiters and you're, you're willing to offer the right salary, we can kind of go out and harvest, right? Um, but I think one thing that we've seen um, you know, on the government side is it's relatively hard to define what some of these other roles are, right? Um, in the private sector, it's often sort of essentially judged by um, in-person interviews with existing experts, right? Like I take my current technical team and I say, you know, having gone through four or five one-hour interviews, is this person a good fit for my organization, right? Um, that's a lot harder for a government organization to do, right? When a way that you have to have something that's um, sort of systematic and, and objective, right? Um, when I'm writing a job description or I'm, I'm categorizing a career field, um, these are things that, that I think DOD is really struggling to wrap their heads around. It's like, who do I call a data scientist or not? Who do I call a product manager or not, right? Um, and that's something that they're really struggling with. Um, so in terms of importance as well, I think something we're seeing in the private sector is it is often becoming more important to be a good software engineering company than it is to be good at your particular industry of expertise, right? Um, Amazon is a software company that happens to do a lot of retail, right? Netflix is a software company that happens to do entertainment and television, right? Um, on the other hand, right, so, uh, Southwest Airlines, for example, suffered a major meltdown in service, right? Like, you know, huge, huge um, uh, losses and, and, you know, massive interference in operations. And they had, like, if you go back at their quarterly statements leading up to that major software-based outage, they basically said, we are under-investing in IT in order to deliver returns to our investors. And they, they said that for about a year, I want to say, before they actually had this major meltdown in service, right? So it is no longer something that you can just sort of outsource to the engineering group, right? This is a C-suite level problem um, that, that companies need to be able to Again, a C-suite you know, person isn't going to say, use this computer language or make this specific product, right? But they need to be able to be informed about what the engineering group is doing and need to be able to put them in a position to succeed. And if you can't, your organization is going to be in real trouble. So Maria, I now want to ask you, you've been part of a number of different studies at RAND looking at different types of technical talent. 
um, what types of technical talent and questions um, has DOD or the different military services, um, what have they been most interested in researching? Thanks, Kirsten, and thank you for having me here. Uh, building off of what my fellow panelists have said, especially Diana, um, the definition of what technical talent is is not really well defined. So that the types of projects I've been involved with really kind of showcase that. So I'm, I have sort of three groups, I guess, of workforce types of group. One that's been involved with studies, one STEM, and as it was, we said that is a much broader category. Many occupations and educational groups are involved in STEM. It overlaps tech talent, but isn't equivalent to it. The second is cyber workforce. Again, involves tech talent, isn't the same thing. And then I've involved in a couple studies with software acquisition development workforce, which is sort of a, a subset of tech talent, but isn't uh, all of it. Um, in terms of the types of questions asked, it's run the gamut uh, across the talent management continuum, obviously. A lot of concerns about attracting talent. Compensation has been the core focus of the STEM workforce. Uh, projects have been involved with, um, and some of that was congressionally directed. Uh, Congress telling DOT, hey, you know, you need to look at the compensation and, and do better for, I think it was scientists and engineers were called out in that language at the time. Um, the cyber workforce uh, studies, again, I've been involved in several, there have been several I haven't been involved with. <laughs> There's always a cyber workforce study. Uh, when we're talking military personnel, a lot of concerns about retention because of opportunities in the civilian sector. Um, sometimes topics training, for example, I was on an army project in fiscal year 16, they were building a new cyber specialty, so the concern was how do we train and retain these personnel. I would say the two studies on software development acquisition were focused at the time, um, this was a few years ago, uh, again, came out of the, the challenges that the Department of Defense have had in the acquisition realm in terms of major acquisition programs that have had cost overruns and a lot of it tied back to, to software challenges like you were saying with Southwest Airlines. Um, so there was this interest of developing competency within the department in software acquisition. But I will tell you the first day on that project, that project was for osd &E at the time was, hey, who's, who's software acquisition? That isn't a codified category in any of the personnel records. And so the project focused on building a competency framework, but then at the end of the project, we said, you're gonna have to do a data call and ask the organizations who's doing this because it's it's not defined. Um, also did some work for the Air Force in 2020, looking at the, the rise of software factories uh, to have an organic or in-house software capability came also out of the acquisition world. But that project was nested within a broader question about the kinds of things Diana raised, digital fluency for the broader workforce. And then that just opens the aperture of who needs digital skills, what kind of skills, at what levels of proficiency and how much and where. And so, um, we ended up focusing on the factories because it was something tangible we can still look at and the people and what they do. But the question the department had was actually a lot broader than that. And we know the Air Force wasn't alone with that at the time we were talking to other services and they were all grappling with, you know, who's doing data science, who's doing AI, who's doing this and that and the other. So I would say there's the, the talent management questions cover, cover the waterfront and so do the <laughs> aspects of the workforce. Okay, thank you. And, and so now that we've talked about some of these different types of technical talent, um, I now want to get at the question of whether there really is a problem for DOD in terms of being able to compete and, um, and being able to recruit and retain the technical talent that they need. So um, James, I know you recently published a study that looked at trends in terms of tech talent migration between different industries, industry sectors and major metro areas. Can you tell us a little bit more about your findings from that study? Yeah, so Diana was actually a, a co-author with me on that. Um, so it was some work we did while she was still at CSET. Um, so what we found was DOD actually sort of in some ways uniquely has a problem here. Um, DOD's, so we, we looked at um, basically data was taken from LinkedIn and we looked at migration of talent, both sort of across industries um, and across metro areas in the United States. Diana had previously done some work um, sort of highlighting where the major US tech hubs were, right? Um, and we really found, you know, DOD uniquely has an outflow problem, right? Um, so, so we joked that the fangs were sort of this black hole of talent, sucking talent from all available corners in. Um, and so their inflow to outflow ratio, if I'm remembering off the top of my head correctly, it was about three to one, right? They brought in three people for about every one person that left their industry, right? DoD was basically reverse, right? Three people leaving for every person that actually sort of came in, right? Um, so 
we didn't delve like deeply into exactly where um, and, and how that was, you know, lots of theories for why that's happening. Um, but I think one thing that that's um, particularly problematic for DOD is the lack of a real mid-career hire system. There's been, you know, reforms aimed at doing this, right? But it is routine at a private sector company for a mid-career hire to arrive, right? Like onboarding somebody with, with five to 10 years of experience is just like a, just business as usual in these places, right? Um, even though DOD has increased their authorities to do so, um, I think the actual arrival of people from like, say like a Microsoft guy with 10 years experience into DOD would be a pretty unusual event, right? Um, and there's problems with things like billets and, and other sort of structural issues where it's relatively hard for someone to show up to DOD and say, I'm a really great career, mid-career mid, mid hire, I'd like to work for you, and actually translating that into, okay, you're working for me tomorrow, right? Lots of problems there. So Diana, as James said, you were a co-author on that report, so I'm, I'm curious to see if you have anything to add, but then also to get your perspective on whether there is a problem here for DOD. Yes, uh, so I'll say yes and, uh, plus one to all of James said. And I've been uh, an audience member on panels where uh, you have commanders saying, hey, it's not fair for all of the rank, you know, the people coming in through the junior ranks, why am I going to laterally? Because there are hiring authorities, there are flexibilities uh, to bring in mid-career professionals. They're not used. Uh, they're not used uh, in the way that they could potentially be used. And I think there's some real questions about, well, what is the effect going to be on the morale of the existing workforce if I bring somebody in to start higher uh, at a higher uh, wage rate or, you know, at a higher rank uh, than somebody who's been working 15 years under me or, or you know, in, in this organization. So I think there's a lot of questions there that just reflect some of the hire to retire mindset that, you know, uh, if we're going to have a serious conversation about the technical workforce uh, in the, the marketplace that we're in, the labor marketplace that we're in, that we just need to kind of start to break down some barriers and ask some hard questions uh, that I think in the long run will be will be great. And, and we can get into some of that conversation uh, in, in the q and I just want to uh, also say that anecdotally, uh, so the data is not great, and we're working on that to really understand uh, in a in a, a rigorous, robust, data-driven way what some of the recruitment and retention challenges are, are with this workforce. But I can tell you that based on work I've done at CSET and now here at CDAO, we try to talk to as many people as we can. And one of the things that we've, uh, we have we also identified while I was at CSET and now I continue to see at CDAO is that we're not appropriately identifying and leveraging the workforce we already have with these skills. And that gets into the taxonomies that we're using, right? That gets into a lot of what Maria was saying about how hard it is to appropriately identify who's doing what now with these skills, because we don't have good definitions because the taxonomies we are using are outdated. And so not only do we have the challenges that, that James was raising, but we have the challenge that we, we, we in fact do have talent with these uh, technical competencies and, and, and a, and a sophistication of expertise that we're just not appropriately able to um, identify or or use in a in a formal way that it, it encourages their promotion and retention. Okay, great. Thank you for that input, Maria. Thinking about what both Diana and James have said, I know you know as we've already talked about, you've done some research in this area. So based on some of that research, are there additional challenges for DOD that, that we should be aware of for recruiting and retaining technical talent? Yes, um, I would say there's some broader issues that are not DOD specific, some that have been extremely well documented, like the civilian hiring process is slow and cumbersome. Uh, we know for technical talent in particular, um, within the Department of Defense, the need for security clearances and requirements, and that not only adds time to the onboarding process, but it's it's recognized that in, in the broader tech sector, there's a, a large number of individuals who are not US citizens or residents. And so that's a talent pool that is a challenge for the department to leverage. Um, I would also say even more broadly, two more things. One, it's interesting when I, you do civilian workforce issues, the civilian brand recognition for DOD is not great. 
uh, there was a study that uh, some brand colleagues did for the Army a few years ago on the Army civilian brand. And they did a survey with some students and young professionals and find like 40% of those surveyed didn't even know you could be a civilian for the Army, like that it was an option. And those who, who knew had a lot of misperceptions uh, aligned with being a soldier. And so just getting the word out, like it's an option is, is one of the challenges the department has writ large, not just for tech talent. Um, and then I also want to, because we talk a lot about attracting talent, but what is not as well known is the work environment, the retention piece. Um, there is some movement, I know, for example, in the Department of Air Force um, is about to pilot a technical track for cyber officers. On the civilian side, there's been a plan to have a functional track. So this is these tracks are have been in existence in the private sector for decades. Um, the idea is, though, that technical folks or functional folks may want to work in technical roles and stay in those roles and have access to interesting projects and programs and tools and resources. Um, so it's some recognition that perhaps um, the work environment itself may not always be conducive to leveraging the talent that you do already have. Um, but the, it's not a as well studied or understood um, issue as like the, the challenge of bringing people into the department. So I'd say those those are kind of in, in addition to the issues my my panels raised. You know, if I could just uh, add on to that briefly. Um, so when I worked in the private sector, I mean, you know, I would get emails all the time from recruiters saying, "Hey, new job out here, new stealth startup, new this and that." Right? DoD and the defense industrial base were basically absent. Right? Like, you know, the, the attitudes, you know, seem to almost be like, "I'll put my job up on USA Jobs. You apply to it if you want to, and I'll take the the people to get there." Right? Um, and so. I think there's a real, you know, and this is something we showed in our, our um, uh, other report, um, there's a real insularity to this, this ecosystem, right, where people sort of go back and forth between the DOD and the DIB. Um, and so we showed with our paper that, that there's um, a much, you know, that that ecosystem is largely sort of isolated from the rest of the US tech ecosystem. And that can partially explain why new technologies like cloud computing and AI are relatively slow to migrate into DOD, right? When you don't have people who are used to using these tools and, and are familiar with what you need to do so, it's gonna take a lot longer for innovation to spread compared to um, the rest of the economy. So next comes the, the big question of, so what can DOD do to ensure it does have the technical talent that it needs? Um, and this, Maria, I actually want to start with you. Um, you know, one factor that often comes up when discussing, you know, how to attract the, the best talent um, is compensation. Um, and I know you've done some work in this area. So can you talk about the role that compensation plays in potentially attracting talent? And I'm also curious, you know, would you say, is this the main area that DOD should focus upon or are there other factors? Thanks, Kirsten. I will start by saying I'm not an economist, but I work with them. <laughs> and so um, I, I somehow ended up co-leading some work looking at STEM compensation between private and public sector. Um, and as my colleagues point out with their work, it, compensation does matter. And the federal government, including DOD, does uh, have challenges in paying some of the, the premiums in terms of income and salary for certain types of roles at certain levels of the experience. Um, and that's, that's a just well-documented. But the work of my colleagues have shown local labor markets matter, the type of role matters, the level of experience matters. And so there's often this, you know, hair on fire, like it's, it's the money, it's the money. Yes, it's the money, but <laughs> it also depends on where you are and what the labor market conditions are. Um, also, you know, the federal government can potentially compete better with the benefits part of the package, not the salary part. And so that's not often brought up as much in conversation. And then moving that from not just you know retirement plans, healthcare plans, but also to non-monetary benefits working for the federal government, that's even less understood. So the STEM compensation work we did, we looked not just at earnings and income, but we also looked at um, hours worked and federal STEM employees tend on average to work fewer hours. Maybe that prefers better work-life balance. So those are the kinds of things that need to be addressed. And like I said, with the branding problem, maybe the focus should be in part on, hey, we have these other characteristics and other features of the work environment in addition to you know the usual types of compensation benefits. It's just, it has been understudied and underdeveloped um, because everyone's so hung up on the, the money problem. 
So, so James, I want to go to you next. So, so based on the work that you've done, what are some strategies that you'd recommend DOD employ to really ensure it has the technical talent it needs? Yeah. Um, I think there's a couple of things we need to think about here. So first off, I think we need to go, like Maria was saying, you know, just beyond compensation, right? We have a, a real problem with organizational culture here, right? The culture of, of most engineering orgs is very sort of outcome focused, right? Like they don't like a bunch of stupid rules and bureaucracy, right? They want to do the cool tech work. They want to get the thing done, right? Um, and DOD is much more of what we call a hierarchy culture, right? So follow the rules, follow the processes. And, and as long as you're following the system, you're sort of doing the right thing, right? Um, whereas you see in, in the best tech talent, right? Um, the, the, the creation of the end result is what matters, right? And so I think DOD needs to think a lot more about how they can align their culture with what actually works, right? Um, that's been a big part of, of Agile in the private sector, right? Is that the team should be empowered to choose their own method of working based on whatever will actually create the best outcomes, right? Um, so in terms of strategies, you know, I think there's a lot of places DOD can try to enter here, right? Um, there's a lot of people who, they make a bunch of money in the private sector, they, they you know, they, they, you know, grind for, for 10 or so years. Um, there are a lot of people I think who are looking to downshift, right? And so I think there is a, a moment for DOD to pitch themselves to guys saying, hey, you aren't gonna have to work 80 hours a week here. This isn't a startup, right? Come with your expertise, come with your knowledge, come be a dev manager here, right? Uh, like a first level um, uh, manager type, right? Um, and, and mentor some of these younger people. Uh, I think the uh, Army Software Factory, for example, um, is having great success bringing in mentors from the private sector. And then, you know, we, we went to tour the Software Factory and almost everybody there was in a green uniform on that day with, uh, you know, one in 10 were, were private sector contractors, right? Um, very few places have that kind of ratio of their tech talent to, to you know, between contractor and government, right? Um, I think that's a, a solution that holds a lot of promise, right? Um, I do think the other, it, it's an interesting dilemma, and I don't know the right answer to this. It's, it's something we'll have to look into. Um, the question is, where should you put yourself, right? On the one hand, you want to be in the tech hubs. You want to be in the atmosphere where things are being invented and where everyone around you is doing great things, right? Um, on the other hand, if you can't compete on compensation, if you can't compete on, on um, culture, if you can't compete on sort of all these other things, I think you do run the risk that essentially all your best people are going to leave immediately for all these other things around you, right? And so how does DOD get that benefit of being sort of in America's most vibrant tech hubs and, and getting that sort of knowledge spreading and innovation um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, spreading as well um, without sort of essentially just being a black hole for everyone else to, to suck, you know, take their, their talent away from. Okay, very interesting. And so Diana, now from your perspective, what would you say can and then is DOD doing to ensure it has the technical talent it needs? Yeah, there's a lot here uh, because it's what my fellow panelists said and. Uh, you know, it's compensation and it's culture and, and we can't, and, and now with remote work uh, and the fact that you do need to go in for a lot of DOD jobs, you can't uh, be as remote as maybe a lot of technical talent would like to be. Um, and the solution can't be let's locate somewhere nobody wants to go. So that way that, you know, talent's not gonna, right. And, and then you can't recruit at that place. And then the, you know, pay scale is too low uh, to, to actually recruit anyway. Uh, there's all of these problems that confound upon each other. That's that's what we have seen. And they span the talent management life cycle. It's compensation and people processes and technology. Um, and, and right now, there are things that DOD can and needs to do to, to start to address all of these issues. If only it was one thing in isolation, but it's it's a multitude of things acting upon each other. And the problems are related, but also different when you're talking about uniform versus civilian, reserve versus active, right? And you have to think about how we can use this really unique and awesome infrastructure that is the reserve component more effectively to address some of these uh, questions. And I think that is one thing DOD is doing, is starting to do really well. Uh, groups like the 75th Innovation Command as kind of a tech talent incubator and the Marines has their own unit now. Um, and, and I think there's a momentum growing with places like DIU, Defense uh, Innovation Unit, to start to build some of that brand equity in the tech community, which is also great. Uh, what we're trying to do at CDAO is a bit radical uh, in the sense that we are trying to build an end-to-end -end agenda that's getting after a lot of these challenges 
together. Uh, and it really starts at the top. It's, it, it is really hard to address challenges associated with a technical workforce you, can, you can't measure and you can't define. Uh, so when we say well, there's a shortage of technical talent, what does that mean? If we don't even know who the technical talent is and we're not planning for what the needs are, we have a supply and a demand data gap. Uh, and so that, that makes addressing challenges uh, in an effective targeted way with limited resources really challenging. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, let's help the components build up their data capability in how they're defining and, uh, and, and, and measuring this workforce doing good workforce planning because you have to budget several years out for what talent you want. Uh, and, you know, it's it's not like industry in that way. And maybe it, is there a way it could be? I, I think that might require some uh, higher level in, intervention. But, you know, what we're trying to do is, is work with partners like the chief talent management office uh, that was recently stood up, like the CIO that spent years building infrastructure around the cyber workforce, like r &E, who's done a lot on the software engineering, especially on the acquisition side. The acquisition workforce is a really cool model for how that workforce is organized and managed. So we're trying to uh, not reinvent the wheel, but also get after a lot of these problems in a, in a thoughtful way, starting with how we define and identify this workforce and, and do workforce planning. You know, we want to be world-class in how we approach uh, data-driven workforce planning and what that should look like. Uh, we're doing something called work roles, which I can get into in the Q&A, but that's an orthogonal way of identifying talent similar to how cyber does it. Uh, we are thinking about uh, a talent marketplace, uh, uh, basically a, a way to uh, recruit talent as an applicant tracking and a system and a CRM and one that, that gets after the customer experience for making people want, want to come and easily apply and have their resume stored that we can use across components. Uh, we are thinking about education and training. We are thinking about uh, assignments, right? Because you mentioned the software factory, great model, but if there's nowhere for this talent to go when they're done with that tour, uh, then they're still going to leave, right? So how can we help uh, start to get at some of these bigger rocks too? Okay, great, very interesting. And I wanna now, before we move on to um, questions from the audience, as a final thing, thinking about the future. And so I'm curious to hear from each of you, what do you see as the biggest challenges in this area in the future for DOD? Um, and how can they get on top of those potential challenges now? How can they maybe address those? Um, so James, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think the biggest problem DOD is going to have to confront is the question of internal versus external talent sourcing for this, right? So when I look around an industry, it's extremely rare for, for industry to outsource the development of software that is critical to their competitive advantage, right? And yet DOD's sort of default model is to outsource almost everything, right? Um, so, so DOD, there's reasons for that, right? The DOD sort of billet limited in terms of how many people they can use. There, there's sort of um, you know various reasons why why they've gone sort of this outsource mechanism, right? Um, but software is not like hardware, right? Where you can simply just get a tool and then sort of have the tool, right? Software sort of increasingly de like defines how your organization actually works, right? You know, your business work processes are done through software, and so whatever software developer makes and, and the rules about that business process. And to some extent, determines how your organization actually functions, right? That's not really a decision that can truly be outsourced, right? Um, and then the other problem is DOD is really, to the best of my knowledge, somewhat unique in its attempt to sort of uh, adjudicate the development of software through a contract mechanism, right? Um, so organizations will, will, you know, sort of purchase software through contract when it's a relatively, you know, a, a process that doesn't really matter to them very much. Like my ability to say, take vacation, like, I'm not really, I don't need to be all that different than any other Fortune 500 company out there doing that, right? I sort of say, here's your vacation balance, you know, go do, do your workday processes, right? But for anything that's custom for my organization, like, that's a very different, right? Like, tr trying to say, you know, trying to solve that agent principle problem through sort of a legal contracting device um, has always been problematic for DOD, right? And it's only worse in software, where most of the time at the beginning, you don't really know what you need in the first place, Right. Um, and so I think figuring out who needs to be internal and how they can sort of, um, when they do have externally sourced talent show up, 
how that it's externally sourced talent can be sort of responsive to the needs of the organization in the right way. I think that's a huge problem that DOD is going to struggle with for quite a while to come. Okay. And Maria, thoughts from you on what the biggest challenges are in the future? Well, from my perspective, it's building off of what they've both said. It's it's defining the requirement within the department. Um, as Diana said, it's very large, very diverse workforce when you start talking about the different components. And so defining the need at the down to the local level, how many people doing what, at what level of proficiency. The department, it's interesting, you do workforce studies with the Department of Defense, whether it's military or personnel, and data exists within department at the local level. I mean, the local managers and employers know their personnel. They collect information in spreadsheets and other forms <laughs> about what their people are doing and, and all of that. But that information just doesn't live in a broader data ecosystem. There isn't the data ecosystem within the talent management enterprise. And so it, it's very hard outside of sort of high level strategy to define, hey, we need you know, data scientists doing this kind of thing here, and we need data engineers here doing these things outside of, say, the, the innovative um, organizations that have already been outlined. And so I think finding that talent, looking at emerging skill trends and gaps is a, an area that the department recognizes, and there's efforts, ongoing efforts, as Diana said, to, to get after that. But I think it's 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 an ongoing challenge. And DOD is not alone in that. There was some McKinsey survey a few years ago, like, like half of organizations said that that surveyed said that that finding understanding clearly what skills their workforce has is a problem, so it's it's a challenge. Um, and I think like to to James' point, if you're going to try to make these decisions about in house versus you know out of house, you need to know what's in house. And I think that's that's something that um, remains an area that the department's going to have to keep going after. Okay. Um, Diana, over to you. What are your thoughts on the biggest challenges that DOD faces in the future in this area? I, I really like what Maria just said that that resonated with me in that it's not even uh, we've talked a lot about what is uniquely DOD in some of these challenges. And there are some uniquely DOD challenges, but there's also challenges that scale nationally. And so that, you know, some of these challenges are not uniquely DOD, but maybe DOD could help uh, lead the way with how we're trying to test out certain solutions, uh, you know, knowing that this could have broader implications. And that also gets to some of the challenges. And, and to me, it's about us getting out of our own way. Uh, we're, so, you know, it takes so long to do things uh, in the department for many reasons. And by the time you catch up, with one area of emerging critical skill need, there's three more that have already showed up. And so it's really hard to, you know, we're, right now we're talking about data analytics and AI, but next year something else might come, uh, uh, you know, some advancement in a new emerging technology that we didn't see and we didn't plan for because we've been so focused on trying to get cyber over the finish line that we haven't been able to really forward think about what's on the horizon and do some of that more forward uh, leaning planning. I really do think the technical workforce is evolving and will continue to evolve with the technologies we already see today as they augment what people are doing. What does that mean for uh, the need for people with uh, coding expertise. Uh, you know, I, I wish that we were asking some of these more forward-leaning questions and that we had the resources to grapple with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you all three for um, that discussion. I wanna open it up now for audience questions. And so just as a reminder, for those of you who are online, you can submit your questions through Slido. If you're in person in the RAND office, you can go up to the microphone. Um, I'm gonna start first by going to some questions from Slido. Um, so our first question that we have is, um, could a pool of technically skill skilled workers from close um, ally nations um, help address temporary shifts in demand? And I'll, I'll open that up. If mm -hmm. um, I think the answer could be yes, but I think the US is gonna have to do a lot more to develop shared infrastructure before that would be possible, right? Right now today, um, I think it'd be incredibly complicated to get US data or, or you know, um, and, you know, US software requirements over to any kind of foreign um, cooperator, even within arrangements like say AUKUS, right? Um, so, so I think as long as the United States is sort of 
um, has its own independent architecture and infrastructure, I think that's going to be relatively difficult. But it's, it's a promising area. One of the ways we could, could deepen our talent pool is to work with highly capable um, allies and partners. I think we're we're getting there. There's some encouraging signs. I think at least sitting from where I sit, uh, I am not on the international team at CDAO, but we do a lot of international engagements uh, with NATO, with partner allies, and they are doing great things when it comes to technical talent that we can learn from and that we can uh, partner with them on. So I think there is a desire and an appetite to, to have these kinds of uh, partnerships. And as James said, uh, there, there, is some, there are some real questions and challenges that we need to address before I think we can do that as effectively as, as we might like. But uh, from where I sit, it does seem that we are asking those, those questions, deal, working through some of the security uh, questions. And this isn't unique to necessarily just us. There's this question about research collaboration too, uh, that I know the broader academic community is, is grappling with. And so it is really about making sure that we've got the, the infrastructure that we need for us to partner together. Okay, great. Related to this, um, somebody else here on Slido has a question. Um, should DOD focus more efforts on building a contractor heavy workforce? with the MILCIV workforce being more in the leadership and PM roles. Curious to get thoughts on that. I guess I'll, since I didn't talk already. Uh, I think this gets at what James was saying uh, earlier about in-house versus out of house. I mean, the department has a pretty strong system with, for PMs and, and in its acquisition workforce, it kind of already has that structure. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, part of it is again, defining what you, the talent in, inside and then kind of contractors will always be part of, probably part of this, this broader solution. But I don't think there, that there's a yes or no answer to that immediately. I think, um, and, and to James' point with software specifically, there's a reason why these innovation units and factories have rose up because there was this recognition like, hey, we are, the department is relying too much potentially of outsourcing software development. Um, and we need some, some more technical expertise in house to under, at least understand it. So I would say it's, it's probably too early to tell one way or the other um, that, that it should be contractor heavy, I would say. So I'll say if they did go down that route, right, I think one of the key things DOD is going to have to understand and change is what a PM is, right? So the problem is PM is an acronym that means a lot of different things. In government, it usually means program manager or project manager, right? In industry, it usually means product manager, right? Those terms don't sound very different. What it actually means is, is actually extremely different, right? Program managers make sure the project delivers on time and on budget. Right. And so they're sort of monitoring and, and confirming, you know, doing oversight of the project, right? And coordinating activities. Product managers are empowered to shape what the product is in the first place. Right. And so if government wants to go down that route, PMs, as they are interacting with a contractor heavy engineering team, need to be extremely empowered to make decisions about what the product is and to make engineering trade-offs when the devs come to them for advice. Right. And so without making that kind of shift. I think for the government to, to sort of take on the role of we'll write all the reports for Congress to you so you don't get in trouble, I mean, I, that, there's some value in that, I guess, right? Um, but if you want to create great software, you need empowered product managers. And if you don't do that, then you know, I think that that pathway won't be all that productive. I, I just want to quickly, you reminded me of something, James. Uh, when we did the software acquisition project for OCR and r &E, we couldn't figure out like whose software acquisition. So at the time, um, when it, there used to be OSD, kind of ATNL infrastructure, they had these things called Fitbits, the functional and great product teams. And there was an engineering one and there was a PM one and, and, and an IT one. And so we said, all right, we're gonna look within those, those three, pro program management, IT and engineering. And uh, James is exactly right. Program management in the acquisition world is, is more, like he said, a managerial type of function. It is not about product management. And so, one of the concerns that that drove the study was, you know, within the PEOs and these other, um, you know, where the PMs would be, that there wasn't enough resident technical expertise to to help with that, to drive that design, um, those decisions. And so, 
I agree that they would have to move in that direction to 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 have a more contract heavy heavy response. Oh. I I just want to add that there's there's a word here that just came to my mind, and uh, not to be the Debbie Downer, uh, but risk. Uh, when you are contracting out a lot of your capability, there's a risk associated with that, and you have to. There's a trade off as with everything, and you have to decide what needs to be no kidding in house, and what. Is it okay to contract out with with the right security arrangements, data ownership and governance arrangements, and so on? I think there's a big opportunity, and we, you know, I don't think DoD could do what it does without its contractor partners, without its industry partners, and that and that connective tissue needs to be there, absolutely. But I do think you also need people in house that have the technical expertise that can, uh, you know deploy where needed as needed uh, to the front line or in the, it, we say boardroom to battlefield a lot at CDAO, but you really do need uh, people that are able to smartly know what you're buying, smartly understand what is actually needed. And some of the best solutions that we've seen have been developed in house because they are next to the problem. They understand the problem. Uh, and, and so I don't think you would want to go too heavy in, in one direction, but I think you need to responsibly uh, have, have both. So okay. I think there's a question um, in the room. So we'll go to that next. Hey, um, Colin Smith, I'm an international uh, senior international defense researcher. One, and you might have characterized this before I, I walked in, I was a few minutes late. When you're talking about mid-tier bringing them in, which does make sense when you have someone that has the experience to bring them in, but you kind of threw it out there as DOD instead of caveat on where you really specify in uniform or the civilian workforce. And even within uniform, the acquisition field has already become somewhat specialized that folks go acquisition, in which case bringing someone in mid-tier probably like medical corps, you bring in a doctor, no one's gonna look at that, but it, you bring it into a squadron, someone that's a pilot for United for 10 years and you bring them in, those are two very different. So could you characterize better instead of broadly DOD on that topic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think you do need to include both depending on what responsibilities you assign to each. Um, I, I do think, I suspect the military will probably mostly keep this in their civilian side as opposed to uniformed, right? Um, you know, uniformed is mostly going to go out and, and do war fighting functions. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it does encompass both to the extent that both are involved in technical talent, but um, I do suspect that the bulk will probably stay in the civilian side, if that makes sense. And, and I kind of had one, one, one other follow up had to do with you mentioned technical more skills. So some of the services do have warrant officers and LDOs that they use quite extensively. So was any of the research looking more at how to, I, I'm not familiar enough with the Air Force because I don't think they have warrant officers and LDOs as much as like the Marine Corps, definitely you can stay technical and do those things you want to do by going warrant officer and or LDO. Oh, I can, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. You're right, the Air Force doesn't have a warrant officer corps. Um, and yes, warrant officers, LDOs have been used for technical expertise in the in the services. Um, and that's probably partly why the Air Force is looking at a technical track for its commissioned officers, be, partly because it doesn't have a, a warrant officer corps. Um, I could speak, the concept of technical talent, um, like I said, is uh, technical tracks have been around for a long time in, and have ebbed and flowed in favorability over time. The biggest challenge we found with looking at literature on technical tracks more broadly which could include potentially the constructs of like warrant officers or LDOs, depending on how you want to think about it, is defining expectations um, very clearly of what those technical experts provide so that uh, there isn't this sort of us versus them between the technical leaders and the, and the more institutional leadership tracks. Um, so it's something that it continues to be explored, I would say. Um, and um, that's about all I can say on it, but yes, it's, it's a topic worth consider continued investigation. <laughs> uh, so it's also, you know, in industry, they do have technical tracks, right? You're, you're allowed to proceed as a, a, what are called ICs, individual contributors, um, up to very high levels, right? And, and very high levels of compensation as well. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in software engineering who are just not good at being managers, right? Like who would you never want to be in a management responsibility on a team? Um, I think part of the problem in the military is 
you know, the differentiation between what an officer is, what a warrant is, and what an enlisted person is, is quite frankly, kind of, it's not a unified concept across all the places it's used, right? Um, you know, I remember we were doing an enlisted panel, and they listed like, we're the guys who do the work, the officers are the guys who manage the work, right? Um, but in the Air Force, a fighter pilot's an officer when he's just flying his individual aircraft and not in a position of management responsibility, right? And so the, the concept of why someone's an officer versus not an officer really is, is highly varied throughout the military system and is, is you know, very much something that has grown organically over time, right? Um, and so, you know, choosing uh, uh, to, to make technical, ta technical talent be one of those paths is something that needs to be done, right? But, you know, do I need to say this technical talent has to be at least a lieutenant because they, they have a, a master's degree, you know, they, they would get paid $200,000 to work for Microsoft. How am I calling this person a private, right? Or a specialist, right? Versus, you know, sort of that, well, they're doing work so, you know, even if we pay them a bunch of money to do it, maybe they should be enlisted because they're not managing anybody, right? Um, I think that's a bit of an internal fight the military is going to have to figure out. So I'm going to go back to questions on Slido. I, we have a lot of really great, great questions. Um, so, so this is, please, you know, if, if your question doesn't get answered during the session, we encourage you to reach out afterwards. Um, we probably only have time for one question left. Um, we have a question here, um, which Diana, I'll send over to you to get your perspective first. So the question is, is there hope for the DOD? As multiple previous studies show, many of these recommendations aren't new. So what will it take for the DOD to take action? So Diana, I want to start with you and get, get your thoughts on that. That's a great question. <laughs> no, I, I am an optimist. Uh, yes, there's always hope and there's a lot of hope. I, I you know... No bias, but the standup of the CDAO shows that there is an acknowledgement at the most highest levels of the department to get after some of these challenges. And that is exactly what Dr. Martell at the CDAO is trying to do. So I think there is a lot of hope, not only at the highest level in prioritizing some of these persistent challenges, you have the creation of the chief talent management officer. Uh, that, that is a new position this year, and he is working very aggressively in partnership with us to get after it. You also have, this, have at the service level, change agents who are incredibly passionate about some of the challenges that we've talked about today that are trying to do good things, that are trying to change processes. The challenge is it's, it is a ship that you are trying to turn. It is slow. Uh, we can't go, uh, you know, I think there was even at CDAO, we wanted to come in and, and do things quickly. Uh, but there are processes that you, some, you know, the sum of which you just have to work through to get it over the finish line in a way that is sustainable. There are a lot of stakeholders at the department. DOD has 3 million people at the end of the day. That is a state, right? So if you're trying to do change at the enterprise level, there are a lot of stakeholders you need to engage and it comes with doing it thoughtfully, uh, understanding, okay, who, do, who needs to be at this table? Let's make sure we're including them early and often. Let's make sure we're doing this in, a, in, in the right way. Uh, but we, with an appreciation and an acknowledgement that the status quo, uh, when it comes to some of these questions, and it's technical talent. There's some other workforces that are also having uh, persistent problems. I, I know the medical corps, the shipbuilding corps. There's other there's other areas where some of what we're doing could really impact how the future force is is uh, you know planned for and managed. So I think there is a, an element of uh, being thoughtful and strategic. Uh, and collaborative and also moving fast. But I, I think there's a lot of pieces that are coming into place. And I think some of the conflicts we've seen just in the last few months and the last few weeks have really shined a bright light on where some of our shortcomings are. And that's really created uh, a sense of urgency to, to get after these challenges. So Maria, I'll, I'll go to you. Um, it, given the studies that you've done, what have you seen in terms of challenges in getting some of the recommendations that, that you've given to DOD and the, the services implemented? Uh, I mean, just dovetailing off of what Diana said, it, DOD's huge and has a lot of missions and a lot of, a lot, a lot of stakeholders. Um, I am encouraged though, um, I was just talking with a colleague before, uh, you know, about, hey, is the work you did getting some traction? I said, well, maybe not now, but it is amazing. You will, 
do something and then find out a couple years later, like, hey, that's being used now. Like Diana said, there's so many different pockets and so many things going on at once that sometimes it takes a little while for the department to digest, or you just need certain people or puzzle pieces to get in place. Um, so I would say it, there are so many factors that affect um, whether something hits. So something we try to do more, um, and we're trying to do more and more is to recognize where the senior leadership is focused on what issues and try to, you know, dovetail some of our recommendations so that we, you know, you strike when the iron is hot because they they do have a lot on their plate. So there's no one answer. <laughs> Anybody who does any policy research will tell you that. But I am also optimistic that, you know, like Dana said, there's a lot of momentum when you see these functions arise in, in a government agency, like a CDO, like a you know, all, as chief data officer, all of this, this, these are signals that they're trying to really get after it. So. James, I don't know if you have additional comments. If not, we can maybe squeeze in one more question. Uh, I'll, I'll try and keep them brief. Um, I, I know I've been very encouraged. I've talked to a lot of people throughout DOD. They're really smart. They've, they've taken the time to sort of learn from industry and, and, you know, sort of achieve best practices. A lot of people I found out there are really doing great stuff. I think there's two problems that that sort of keep them that inhibit them right one is um there's all you know this is a universal problem communication between the technical people and the non-technical people right um it's very very hard um in a lot of cases for the techies to sort of um help non-technical leadership understand what they need and why um and so the more we can do to sort of educate our non-technical leadership what they need to be asking what they need to be understanding and, and give them sort of the a, enough um, a, a context to make good decisions. I think that's a critical element. Um, the second part is we need to reform government oversight and um, sort of process, right? Like right, right now we are driven towards waterfall, which is not best practice um, by a lot of sort of institutional things, right? And so people are sort of fighting upstream to do what works and what's actually right for the project um, when you know the system is sort of pushing them in the wrong direction. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we are unfortunately um, towards the end of this session. As I said, um, we've had a lot of really great questions and comments come in through Slido. So again, I encourage those of you, we didn't have time to get all of them answered um, during this discussion, but please reach out to our panelists. Um, so I wanna end by thanking all of our panelists, um, Maria, James, Diana, thank you for your really insightful comments. Um, today, I think this has been a very, very interesting discussion that I've been um, honored to moderate. And thank you um, to all the audience members for joining us today and for um, the questions that you have sent. Um, this is obviously an issue that is going to continue and I'm sure we will have many future discussions on. So thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate your time today. <laughs>